Welcome to the Nicholas Natalie Show. Today on the podcast, guest Vegan Danielle. Yes, her first name is Vegan. She's a podcast host, vegan enthusiast. She's lived a life full of experiences more than anyone Nick knows. This is part one of the podcast. If you want to hear the second part, scroll on over to her podcast. The link will be in the show notes and you can listen to part two there. As always, head on over to nicholasnatalie.com forward slash shop. Use the discount code the NN show 20 for 20% off. Also, 4th of July sale coming up, so you better be ready. Leave a five-star review if you like the podcast. Honestly, if you like it, just leave a review. We're trying to get to 100 reviews that are five stars. As always, this episode is sponsored by Little Webby LLC at littlewebby.com. They create the best darn custom software, websites, and mobile applications. DM them on Instagram at Little Webby LLC and say we sent you for a free 30-minute consultation. As always, I'm the intern. You're the listener. This is Nick. Hello and welcome. This is the Nicholas Natale Show. I am your host, Nicholas Natale. We have a very special guest today, Vegan Danielle. Vegan Danielle. Season's greetings. Hello. <laughs> I am so pumped that you're here. I I you know what? We're just gonna dive right into it. You were born in Riverside, but you grew up in Wrightwood, and I gotta say oh, and you went to Serrano High, which is extremely close to where I grew up. That's super crazy. close. Right? I'm I'm from Victorville. Yeah, that nobody knows where Serrano <laughs> is. <laughs> I have yeah, I have Many of friends that have gone to Serrano High School. So when I saw that, I was like, no way. There's not another person in this world that's from the high desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we, I think our my middle school graduating class was like 99 or something. I think high oh, school shoot. was like 400. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I don't even know if I should tell you what school I went to. I don't even know if it was around. It was... um. It was AAE. It was a tiny charter school in Apple Valley. Ah, okay. I thought you were going to say Sultana. <laughs> I did pop in there a few times just to say hi, but never went there. Um, <laughs> I got to know about Wrightwood. Did it have the same mantra as people that lived in Victorville that you got to get out of there quick or you're going to be stuck there forever kind of deal? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that was definitely it. Like it was the high school that everyone knew everyone and you know, we all snowboarded up at Mountain High and like my mom was a teacher at the school and you know, the, it was like the the pastor's wife worked at the school. Like everybody knew everybody. <laughs> so like if you didn't get out of there, you were going to be having babies with people there. So <laughs> Oh yeah. And then you're locked in. That that was like one of the biggest driving factors in my youth that like I just have to get out of the city and maybe mm-hmm. I'll have a shot mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe I'll have <Yeah>. a chance <laughs> me too me too that's actually kind of the start of my story it was just uh escaping the high desert <laughs> oh man well I sh- okay before we get into that I do have one quick story for you about my experience at Mountain High mm-hmm. because Mountain High ski resort I guess I guess you would call it a resort I'm not sure that <laughs> And I went there once. I'm usually a a Bear Mountain guy when it comes to snowboarding. Mm -hmm. I went there once, and I left with 16 stitches in my leg. It was the only (laughs) time I've ever gone there. It's really icy. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely, definitely rocked my world. But, okay, Danielle, how did you escape the high desert? That's what I want to know. Oh, my God. How censored is your podcast? (laughs) Uncensored. I, I did my research, so... Yeah. Please let me in. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I have kind of a colorful upbringing. I um, I don't I don't like to talk too much about people that were involved because I don't like placing blame or any sort of negative attention on people. But I grew up in a kind of a rocky childhood. Uh, dad was a heavy drinker. Mom tried really hard to do her best with what she had and uh, was working two jobs and going back to college to get her master's at the same time and. You know, I was a young teenager who had been locked up uh, in this small town and, you know, this little bubble (laughs) of of what I thought was normal. And for me, it was at the time. And I don't know, it just came a certain time. I was about 17. I decided to finish high school early. I went on home studies at Desert View High School and finished my junior year. What would have been my junior year? And I was like, I'm getting out. 
and I had a friend they oh and I, I already had a car because I started working when I was like 14 I was doing I was working in the school cafeteria when I was 14 and then I got like an actual job when I was 15 working at McDonald's so nice. and then I worked at Mountain High after that so I had been working pretty consistently saved up some money and my biggest goal was like getting out of here uh, so by the time I was 17, I was very innocent. I was very like sheltered by the small town. Uh, parents were religious. There was like, I, I wasn't really allowed to have a lot of friends over. So I didn't really talk to people much. And then one of my older friends uh, that I used to snowboard with had this brilliant idea that we should drive to LA, which I had never really been to before and mm -hmm. go to one of Inglewood's most popular strip clubs. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Always the start of a good story. <laughs> right. So this young, impressionable, trusting girl says, yes, <laughs> that's me. So I, uh, we go in the car, and I find out that it's amateur night. I think it was a Monday night. And um, she tells me, not only are we driving down there, but we're going to go to amateur night, and we're going to be on the stage. And I'm like, oh, oh hell wow. no. Like, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, like, I, I'm not sexually experienced at this point. I, I don't really know even anything about my own body, let alone other people's. I've never seen a naked girl before because I went to private school where we didn't have <laughs> locker rooms. And <laughs> I'm, like, terrified. I'm like, okay, we're going to need a lot of drugs and alcohol to get through this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did. Um, we did amateur night. I think I won, like, second place. I had a fake ID, by the way. I was only 17, and she arranged that. And um, it, I, I think I made like $400. They let you work that night as well. And, you know, to some young 17-year-old, 400 bucks is like what I was That's making in two weeks. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I tried to figure out a way that I was going to keep on working there. I actually <laughs> filled out the uh, quote-unquote application. I think it was an I-9 at the time. Um, to work there and I used the fake ID as my information. They, I'm pretty sure they had to know that it wasn't me, but you know, whatever right. it was, Inglewood. So yeah. <laughs> I, um, I worked there for a little bit after, I don't know, maybe like four months, my friend ended up turning on me. I, I, I mean, whatever, I have suspicions on why that happened, but, uh, we were both kids. Like, let's just leave yeah. it at that. We were both kids just trying to do our own thing. She ends up telling not only the owner of the strip club, but the cops that <laughs> I was underage. And oh, so, whoa. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I got a phone call from the cops on my drive home one night. And um, as soon as they called, I didn't even talk to them. They called and they said, you know, this is Inglewood PD, blah, blah. We're looking for this person, the person that was on the uh, license. Fake and ID? I just hung up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I know what this is. Okay, bye. <laughs> So it was about, I don't know, I, I guess maybe two to three months before my 18th birthday. So I went to San Diego because at this point my mom had said, like, she didn't know exactly what I was doing, but she knew I was getting into trouble. And my mom said, well, you know, if you're going to be continuing getting into trouble, uh, you just don't don't come back up here because basically, like, you're not welcome. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. okay. So, and I get it now, like as a kid, I was so resentful, but now I'm like, okay, I totally understand why she did that. And so I went to go live with my grandma in San Diego and, um, uh, my grandma, I don't think she really had any idea of what I was doing because I was a little angel to her. And so a few months went by, I, uh, turned 18, went to another club that was right down the street from that one in LA and uh -huh. applied there. Um, and then we'll just fast forward because I could probably go on for 10 hours about what happens in strip clubs. But Oh, no. Yeah, no. I w those are the details that I want for <laughs> sure. I don't leave anything out. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little summary. So obviously there's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of alcohol. There's a lot of um, gang violence. There's mm -hmm. Most strip clubs are owned by mob or you know some sort of gang. And that one in particular was. And so... Uh, you, you don't exactly have rights. Like, I wouldn't say we were, like, slaves, but, like, it was, like, if a guy did something they weren't supposed to do, there wasn't really any protection for us. It was, like, well, oh, no. yeah, you work in this industry, so what do you expect? Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of that, and, and the way that I grew up, I, I was never really taught by my parents, like, respect or, like, how guys were supposed to treat women or whatever, and my dad wasn't right. exactly the best example, so... I just kind of went along with things out of fear. Um, and, you know, at times there was some violence. Normally it wasn't. Normally it was just, like, super grabby guys, and it was just like, okay, whatever. 
Um, but the money was really good. And so I kept doing it because I didn't know what else to do. You know, I'd finished high school, but at this time I hadn't gone to college. And so I just kind of like went along with what life had presented me. And then I think it was maybe like, I don't know, six months or a year later, I ended up working at a, <laughs> sounds funny saying it now, but a better club. It was uh, Spearmint Rhino, which was in LA. They're kind of known for like their upscale girls and like you actually audition to work there, like not just anyone gets hired. And the customers are classier, the lap dances are twice as much, whatever. So I ended up yeah. getting a job there. And uh, it was in downtown LA, right by the Staples Center. And so we would get like Lakers players come in and like investors and like big, big shots, you know, doctors, lawyers, whatever, not just like the sort of gangbang stuff that I was used yeah, to. Yeah. Not gangbang, like, you know what I mean? Not like sexually. But, like, <laughs> I got, yeah, I got. Gang members. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it kind of. I don't know if it was a curse or a blessing because that's really what kind of kept me in the industry longer because I went from making, I think at the other club, a good night was like three, 400 bucks. And then yeah. I start working at Experiment Rhino and the average night is a thousand dollars. And I'm not talking about sexual favors. Like I'm just talking about lap dances. And then, and at this time I wasn't 21 yet. And then I turned 21 and a friend from Experiment Rhino says, you know, there's a lot more money in Vegas. So let's go out there. I'm like, okay. So we go to Vegas. Uh, my thing was I would fly out there on Thursday night. I would work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, fly home Sunday. Um, it was like on average, <laughs> an average weekend in Vegas was almost $10,000 just dancing. Like it was. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, insane. And we had way more protection in Vegas because there were a lot of undercover cops in there. And like <laughs> they, the, I mean, the cops were like good and bad. They would try to like. They would try to proposition you to throw you in jail, but you could kind of tell which ones they were. But then yeah. they would also, like, if other guys were trying to proposition you, like there were, or if they were being violent, there was some protection there. So yeah. I don't know. It was such a, like, love-hate relationship with them. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of money, and so once again, I just dealt with things. And over some time, you know, I had I, – I bought a condo. And, I mean, at this point, like, I'm – 21 years old so I, I bought a condo making and, solid bunny yeah yeah and I bought a Mercedes I bought a street bike I, I mean it was just like it was all about the brands it was all about the stuff that I didn't have when I was a kid so I'm like Gucci bags Christian Dior glasses like all this stuff I'm like I am looking styling you know at this point yeah. like <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that was attractive to me you know it was something I hadn't had and um I got into a little bit of modeling. I did uh, some stuff. It was mostly like, I, I'm really into like the car industry and like motorcycles and stuff. So I did some stuff for car magazines and I, I had a motorcycle and I'd done some motorcycle photo shoots and just like, I don't know, just a bunch of that kind of stuff. And I, I had this goal of like, well, dancing is making me a lot of money. I'm going to get to like a certain point. I didn't have a number, but like a certain point. Yeah of savings and then I'm going to get out and I, I started going back to school I went to Santa Monica College uh, with a major in computer science and oh wow um yeah it was I was always kind of like the nerdy smart kid that like didn't fit into the strip club at all like I it's funny I'd end up trying to have these like psychological <laughs> conversations with like guys that would come into the club and then they'd yeah. like it'd kind of kill the vibe and they'd be like <laughs> okay well I feel like guilty for dancing with you now and I'm like shit yeah. <laughs> So, That's hilarious. Um, yeah, and then at 20, 20 years old, right before my 21st birthday was kind of when a really major shift happened. So I had my motorcycle at a little Yamaha R6, and I was up riding up in the canyons in, in L.A. I was living in both L.A. and Vegas at the time, and I uh, was riding, and there was a semi-truck in front of me, and he had kind of moved over, like, into – there wasn't really a shoulder, but there was, like, a little – I don't know. Little, little ledge kind of deal. Little ledge, yeah. And he, like, gets over. It's only about two feet wide, I bet. And and he gets over a little bit. And I thought he was getting over because I was in his left view mirror. And I thought he mm -hmm. saw me and was trying to let me pass. So I hit the gas. I hit the throttle. And he didn't have a blinker on. And he makes a left turn down this little <sighs> tiny dirt road I didn't see. <sighs> so <laughs> semi-truck versus motorcycle, he won. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's a tough fight to win. <laughs> right, so he ends up uh, actually running over my foot. Um, my foot got stuck under his back tire. Uh, I just remember looking down. I, I don't remember feeling anything at the time. I was in so much shock, but I I just remember like putting my hands and I was wearing boots. I was in full gear, and I 
I put my glove, my hand, my gloved hands on my foot, and I just remember thinking, hold pressure. Like, I hadn't even, like, seen what had happened yet. I just knew I should, like, apply pressure. Mm. And then some woman, and this is up in the canyon, so there's no cell service. There's no hops or anything. And this woman happens to be driving by. I, like, call her my little guardian angel. And she uh, pulls over, and she gets out of her car, and she comes up to me. And at this point, the semi-truck driver hadn't even gotten out of his truck yet. I think he was scared. And she comes up to me, and she goes, let me see. And I was like, you don't want to see. It's got to be really bad. Like, there was a lot of blood. And she goes, just let me see it. And this was going to be the first time that I was going to see it. And so I take my hands off. And I just remember blood just like pouring out of my boots. And um, she tries calling 911, and I, she ended up getting through. And then at one point, the semi truck driver gets out of his car. Um, he didn't finally. speak very much English, huh? I said, finally. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I think he was scared. And like, honestly, you know, I- I'm assuming maybe he didn't have insurance or maybe there was a legalization issue or something because just right. the way he acted wasn't like normal and he comes up to me and starts screaming at me in Spanish that it was my fault I should have been paying attention and I just looked at him and I'm like dude I don't care like I'm not even mad you know I'm like I just need help like I'm not I want my foot fixed man come on exactly so I don't know who called who or what happened you know obviously the whole thing is kind of a blur but I end up getting airlifted to a hospital uh they take me to downtown USC's hospital where (laughs) I'm like met with Tons of people with gunshot wounds and gang violence wounds and all this <laughs> stuff. And I'm, like, this only white girl. And, like, the cops were, like, standing by my bed for, like, protection. And people, these gang members are, like, yelling at me, like, like these racist comments towards me for oh being gosh. a stupid white girl and all this stuff. And I'm just, like, oh, my God, you guys, like, I don't, I don't even care. Like, I just, I just need some help. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Can I get a doctor in here? Come on. What's taking so long? Seriously. So... <laughs> It ended up taking so long for the doctor to come in and uh, rinse the wound that I got a massive infection in my foot. And um, anyway, fast forwarding, they ended up taking me over to Kaiser, which is the insurance I had at the time. It was uh, Kaiser in Northridge. And um, they ended up having to cut off a lot of dead tissue, muscle and and skin. And uh, they did a skin graft. They took some from my thigh and then stapled it to my foot. And, you know, I was in the hospital, I think I think it may be a week uh, on a a morphine drip and amongst many other painkillers they were giving me and uh when they released me I was in a wheelchair and uh they released me with like 80 milligram oxy prescription and that was kind of the start of what I didn't know was going to be the biggest downfall of my life and I you know like I'd said I'd already been exposed to drugs the strip club is friendly with drugs I I was mostly doing uppers like cocaine and ecstasy but um heroin was that one drug that I was like I will never do that like I'll do all the party drugs but I'm never gonna do heroin and after I had the oxy prescription which for those listening that may not know they're very similar compounds oxy and heroin and um I had connections and I remember I was stuck in my house all by myself and Um, a friend of mine who also happened to be a drug dealer was like, Hey, let's go up to Santa Barbara. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I need you to, you should get out of your house and and get out, you know, you've been stuck in a wheelchair for however long. And I'm like, okay. So I jump in the house. That sounds great. Yeah, exactly. And I, I didn't really care what was going to happen because I was so bored and like (laughs) helpless. Uh, so we go up to Santa Barbara and like, I don't remember if I knew he did heroin or not, but I knew he dealt drugs and then we were all, we went over to his friend's house. We're all like popping ecstasy. Like <laughs> I've got, you know, one leg at this point, pretty much like yeah. one useless <laughs> one. Um, They're popping and you're hopping. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I remember laying on this couch, like just watching everybody do their drugs. And um, he asks me if I want to try heroin. And I don't know what the switch was in my mind at that point. I don't know if I was just such a low depression that I was like, fuck it, or I trusted him or whatever. But I said yes. And he, and I was like, look, I'm terrified of needles. Like, I don't really want to go anywhere near him. But, and he's like, oh, I'll do it for you. And I'm like, okay, well, this guy's a heroin addict. Like, he's used to shooting up himself however much all the time. This was my first time. And so I OD'd. And... Uh. I the next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital, a new hospital with cops around me. And 
I didn't know what happened. I just remember waking up crying and I just remember they kept on asking me, who did this to you? Who did this to you? And I remember just saying over and over again, no one did it. I did it. I did it. Like it wasn't anybody. Um, and oh, wow. yeah, I don't You're know not why. A that, yeah, no, I was like, <laughs> I just, I just remember thinking like nobody did this on purpose. So why would I like try to get someone in trouble? Um, so I don't know what happened. I don't remember what happened after that, but they left and then the hospital released me. I had no idea the address of this friend's house, which is where my crutches were, my phone, like everything was at this friend's house. I don't even know this guy's name, right? Like my friend brought me there. Yeah. And I'm in the middle of Santa Barbara, like, I don't know, a couple hours away from where I lived and the hospital's kicking me out on crutches because they're like, uh, we can't hold you anymore. Like you're back to normal. I didn't get arrested. (laughs) Yeah. And so I literally get on my crutches and start because my wheelchair is at that friend's house (laughs) and I start hopping outside. Like at this point, it's like, I think late afternoon, the sun was like starting to go down and I'm like, what the fuck? I don't even know where I'm going. I don't know what happened. I don't know this guy's name. Like what the hell? And I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember that a truck, like a pickup truck, a guy in a pickup truck comes up to me and he's like, oh my God, there's a female like hopping on crutches down the street. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. And he like comes up to me and he's like, do you need a ride? And I'm like, yeah, but I have no idea where I'm going and my phone is dead, whatever. So anyway, he ends up having a phone charger in his car. We charge my phone. Um, in my phone, thank God, there's a voicemail from one of the people at the house that basically is like, get your shit, come over here, get your shit and get the fuck out. Like, we don't want to see you anymore. So I called the number back and they gave me the address. I was like, oh my God, thank God. Um, so I get back there. They weren't exactly too friendly with me, but whatever. (laughs) I get it. Um, so anyway, Long story short, we're fast forwarding. I ended up being a heroin addict for a couple years. I you went back to dancing. You can't skip like that. Are you kidding me? You're just going to skip all of that? I feel like if I go on too much, people are going to be like, all right, all right, you did drugs. We get it. <laughs> no, this, but it's it's so, all of it is so shaping. You know, all of it is also so interesting. It, Hit it's, me. You know, sometimes I forget that because I realize when I'm talking to people that don't have these experiences, they're like, uh you did what (laughs) um well okay so what i will say is before i got into the heroin like i i think i had kind of mentioned in the beginning i had done some modeling and like playboy parties and stuff like that Mm -hmm. mansion parties whatever and i i was in the lingerie bowl the um lingerie football league where we played football in our underwear that was kind of fun and it was televised and there was just a lot of a lot of like really cool stuff that kind of happened before the drug use got too bad and i i remember uh, after I had kind of recovered, I, I did buy another motorcycle not too long after <laughs> I got wow, out of Wow, no fear. No fear at all. I was just kind of that, like, I'll prove you wrong person. Like, I remember the doctor mm. saying, you're never going to ride again. And I was like, screw you, <laughs> asshole. Like, <laughs> so, oh, that was another thing was the family that I was staying with in North L.A. It was in Simi Valley. Um, they mm. weren't exactly cool with me doing drugs. So, like, when I made it back to their house, even though what? I was in a wheelchair, they were like, uh, tomorrow morning you're out. Like, figure it out. And I'm like, whoa. Ooh, okay. Um, so, I ended up getting an apartment down by LAX. And I lived alone in a wheelchair. And, and there was no such thing as, like, Uber Eats or anything at the time. But there was a Ralph's next door. And they had <laughs> just started doing delivery to, like, nearby neighborhoods. So oh, I used blessed. to like order my groceries online. We had a gym inside the complex. And so I would ride the stationary bike. And I, I remember just like trying to nurse myself back to health. Like I would push my leg. Like the, I had completely lost all muscle tone in my right leg. So it was, and I'm a pretty muscular person normally. So it was like, my leg was like half the size of the other one. And oh, geez. yeah, it was crazy. And I remember like at this point um, was probably where the lowest depression came because it was like, I not only have all this time on my hands to start thinking, I'm a drug addict, I'm kind of a stripper, but, like, not in work right now, and Mm. I was that, like, all-star kid in school, in sports, in, you know, because I used to be a competitive snowboarder when I was in high school, and, like, just, just straight-A student, honor student, like, all these things, and now I'm, like, I am a stripper drug drug addict, like, what the hell has happened to me, and... I, instead of getting better, I got worse. I remember um, having other friends come over that they would bring Xanax and heroin. And, you know, I continued using after the overdose. And 
I, I would sit there with a bottle and some Xanax, and I remember just writing these, like, hate notes to my dad, just like, this is your fault, because like, I had never confronted him about anything in my childhood, and, like, I don't, I never sent the letters, but they were just, like, the you're first time I... You're finally admitting them, like, you're finally feeling them, right? Right, like, it was the first time that I had finally been, like, damn, like, some shit happened to me, and I gotta stop covering it up. Yeah. Um, I probably should have gotten some outside help at that time, but I wasn't ready, <laughs> And I don't know, things kind of, um, things, things got worse from there. I, I, after that, I ended up moving back up to North Hollywood area. I kind of bounced around a lot. And I was uh, working again at a different Spearmint Rhino up in Van Nuys. And then, um, you know, I still had, I had my second street bike. I still had a Mercedes. I was like, on the outside, everything looked great. But on the inside, yeah. I was miserable. Like, I was really good at showing the world all the things I had, all the physical things I had, but I wasn't good at telling anybody how I was really feeling. And so I felt like a fake. I felt like, like my life was a facade. Everybody only saw the good things. And, you know, this was before Instagram, but I was on Facebook and, and it was like my entire life on Facebook was just like money, you know, good cars, like Christian Dior, like all these like designer brands, you know, it's just like, look at me, look at me. But like inside I was terrified and I was miserable and I was like, I don't know, shit was crazy. And just flexing, just straight flexing oh. on everybody. Dude, but I also seriously. imagine like that's like from what I know about your upbringing, that's kind of how things were then too, you know, like you yeah. were covering you were covering for your own feelings you're covering for your parents you're yeah taking care of your brother from what I know and it's like growing up like those habits stick with you until you can't keep it up anymore you know and I feel like yes. that's probably at the point you're at yes and I I've taken some sort of uh like I wouldn't call them proficiency exam or maybe personality tests like some of the more like the qualified ones from like accredited universities and some of the areas that I test really high in is protective energy and um, compassion and things like that. And so I think I spent a lot of my life not just hiding things to protect myself, but to protect others. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you're hanging out with drug users and strippers and like the entertainment industry, most people you're around don't exactly possess those same qualities. So I was hurt a lot. Like there was a lot of times where I'd have expectations for people to be there for me because I was there for them and it just didn't turn out that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I learned, you know, it kind of toughens you up, which I don't know if is good or bad thing, but um, it got to a point where, so I started working again, but I was, I mean, I was a full blown heroin addict at this point, like to the point where I'm like not showing up to, the, to work anymore. Like I'm not, um, you know. No a, longer a, a, functional. Yeah, no longer functional. It's it's really easy to do with heroin. <laughs> um, <laughs> and now I'm, like, really, I'm hanging out with the actual dealers. And, like, there came a point where I had a friend. Uh, he came over. He was an addict, and, and I was buying drugs, and he was homeless and whatever. And I um, – some guys we were buying from learned a little bit too much about me, and I didn't, I didn't understand the danger at the time. Yeah. And, like – a few weeks later, I was set up. Um, my car was stolen. My house was robbed. The guys uh, totaled my car in the middle of an intersection in Van Nuys and ran. I got sued for the accident because they couldn't find the driver. And Jeez. the other person was severely hurt. Um, my car was completely totaled. Well, that was the podcast. Thank you for listening. Next week, Morgan Justice, Friday at 6 a.m. So wake up, get yourself a coffee, and listen to the podcast on your drive to work. She's a singer. She had two well-received albums in 2018 and recently put out two banging singles, BFF and Junebug. Also, she's a model, modeling for Boutine LA, Amma Bikinis, and more. So head on over to the wherever you find this podcast spotify uh apple podcasts youtube if you want to watch nick and at this point i'm just rambling so if you're still listening leave a five-star review and we'll see you next week